No saint or early church father in the first 500 years of church history defended or approved of icon veneration. It went without saying that this was the practice of the heathen, and Christians didn't practice such a thing. It is the practice, almost unanimously, of false religions. And so why would Christians copy such a uh, disastrous and wicked practice? The heathen use images and icons and statues uh, in their worship. It was idolatry indeed to the early church to promote and require the practice for all Christians as the 787 Council uh, Nicaea II does is anti-traditional and clearly non-apostolic. Yet many argue from the Old Testament worship that we can use images in worship. Do the carved cherubim on top and beside of the Ark of the Covenant prove we can bow down to images and have them displayed in our churches as aids in worship, or even intermediary type windows into heaven? Uh, we will also address and consider the bronze serpent made by Moses at the end as well. So number one, five reasons that uh, this is a very weak and invalid counter argument by Roman and Eastern Christians, starting with number one, the carved cherubim were directly commanded and authorized by God to be made. He actually commanded and authorized them. Roman statues were not, Eastern icons were not, so they're unauthorized and unnecessary at best. So you need a very extremely good reason to include them in worship. The Lord our God has not blessed them. He's not authorized them. He's not appointed them in his sacred and holy worship. Consider God's principle of worship, Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, not whatsoever you feel like doing. Icons in worship and icons to venerate is adding to and diminishing from God's sacred and pure worship. Number two, the cherubim were never bowed down to directly or explicitly in scripture neither were they prayed to or through or used as aids in worship or to help worship kissed or burned incense to like popes do to statues of mary there is no parallel they were not regarded as sacred or called such they were not windows to heaven or mediators either and also consider the kissing of graven images and lifeless statues. Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Right? The Lord God says elsewhere that who is like him? Who is like him? You can't compare him. Right? There's no likeness that you can make of God himself. He will not share his glory or his praise to graven images. They are an abomination to him. They are vile in his sight. They are not to be used in worship, period. First Kings 19, 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, the false god, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So you see, bowing and kissing uh, religiously is a form of worship. They are expressions of worship, right? And I use that word uh, religiously, deliberately. It's not just any bowing. It's not just any kissing, but in a religious or cultic situation or scenario or context, uh, bowing and kissing, especially uh, as a form of sacred homage religiously, is a form of worship. To do it towards a false god is therefore idolatry. Hosea 13 verse 2, And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver, and idols according to their own and understanding. 
all of it the work of the craftsmen they say of them let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves this is what the idolaters did they kissed the calves they kissed their statues and this is what the pope does this is what many roman catholics have done for centuries burning incense to and kissing and bowing down to images and so religiously kissing a sacred object was a form of heathen divine homage or idolatrous worship changing the image into a so-called christian image doesn't suddenly make it right number three the cherubim on the ark and beside the ark were placed out of sight in the holy of holies the inner sanctuary behind the curtain as you see on the left and not placed in the open or in the synagogues which were like the jewish churches the regular worship of the common people for all to see and behold and honor they weren't placed in the open in the regular common places of worship they were not used as aids in public worship like the roman catholic and eastern orthodox churches do the high priest would go through the curtain and into the holy of holies the inner sanctuary out of sight once a year on yom kippur yom kippur the day of atonement he would burn incense he would sprinkle the blood and you see the 15 foot carved cherubim beside the ark they were also out of sight they were used for uh, they were they were never used for public worship the art inside the temple on the walls quote carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers first kings 6 29 weren't venerated either we don't even know what the cherubim looked like was it a human humanoid figure was it an angel was it a beast we don't know what the cherubim looked like so you cannot make much of this they were placed out of sight in the sanctuary number four we don't have the temple anymore we've lost the ark of the covenant to base your so-called christian practice of icon veneration on old covenant worship is risky at the very best will we also add burnt offerings how many old covenant practices that that are found only in the old testament worship how many should we go back to how many should we add into new covenant worship we're given no example and no warrant to venerate icons anywhere in the old or new testaments to take temple carvings in the old covenant which are fulfilled and abrogated in the new covenant worship exaggerate them and require christians to bow down to images is very twisted and highly dangerous to risk idolatry based on excessive and overblown interpretations of vague passages is foolish to say the least and number five even if we assume people bowed down in reverence and honor to the ark of the covenant itself compare joshua 7 6 this ark was special in old covenant worship for it had the very presence of god and the very glory of god it was even a type of christ the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us dwelt among us tabernacled and we have seen his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father john 1 14 and so it was a type of christ it pointed to the incarnation itself joshua 7 6 is actually vague and debatable it seems joshua was simply falling down before the ark in grief and in the dust he put dust on his head due to the 36 of his men that were struck down now what about the brazen serpent or the bronze serpent that moses made it became an idol and it was destroyed by the godly king hezekiah since they burned incense to it second kings 18 verse 4 so burning incense again in a religious context is a form of worship and so we are to only burn incense if god has appointed it he authorized it in the old testament 
but he has not authorized it in the New Testament. Again, popes kiss and burn incense to statues of Mary. How can this not be idolatry? Moreover, the bronze servant, serpent was one time. It was a one-time thing. It, is, it, is, it was likewise commanded directly by God to be made of Moses. Numbers 21 verse 8. Creating your own images, not commanded by God in order to venerate them, is vastly different. And yes, it is in fact idolatry. James Fisher summarizes these arguments well in question 51 sub question 25 in his catechism, where uh, were not the images of the cherubims placed in the tabernacle and temple by the command of God himself? Answer, yes, but out of all hazard of any abuse being placed in the holy of holies, where none of the people ever came, they were instituted by God himself, which images are not, and they belonged to the typical and ceremonial worship, which is now quite abolished. So the old covenant ceremonial typical or types and shadows of the old covenant has been abrogated and fulfilled with the coming of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection. Paul said, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And John said, little children, keep yourselves from idols. But it seems too many professing Christians say instead, keep yourselves as close to idolatry as possible without committing it. How does this make any sense? Copy the heathen. Do what they do. It looks exactly the same. Keep as close to idolatry as possible, but change the word. Change the word worship as well. It's not really worship. It's veneration. It's godly honor. Do everything that looks like heathenism and paganism, but say it's not idolatry. Say it's not worship. It's godly veneration. It's sacred. It's just images, not idols. Well, the people of God have always been very prone to fall into idolatry and are repeatedly warned throughout the Old and New Testaments, but it seems Roman and Eastern Christians are not even concerned by their own standards, playing with fire and toying with idolatry by their own standards. Dear listener, you have committed idolatry, as have I. It is a great evil. It is treason against the crown of heaven. It is a terrible evil indeed. We've sinned against God grievously, yet it is forgivable. Christ has died for idolaters. He has paid the price. He has bled for the sin of image veneration. There is still hope. There is hope. Come. Come to Jesus Christ freely, offered to you in the gospel. Come to him for pardon and acceptance. Plead his merits and his merits alone. The infinitely holy God demands and requires perfect obedience, nothing less. He is perfect. He is holy. He is holy beyond imagination. Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Even your best deeds are contaminated with sin. He demands perfect obedience righteousness and Christ alone has provided such receive his perfect righteousness it is sufficient receive it by faith alone and live for him in thanksgiving for so great a salvation amen